with all of you. Now, I have had an unusual experience for the last 48 hours. I've had person after person coming up to me and apologizing. I'm really sorry, I'm really sorry. And I wondered, you know, what I had done to provoke all these apologies. He said, my flight's leaving Friday night. My flight's leaving Saturday. I'm not going to be here. I apologize, I apologize. And I began to wonder, hmm, <laughs> will anybody be here on Saturday night? <laughs> and here you are, and we, my friends, are the remnant. Now, I wonder what you know about remnants. This always happens. In a, the last night of a last conference, people got to get home. They got Sunday. They got all kind of stuff. They got flights. Remnants are radical. Do you know that? Remnants are radical. There are plenty of people in this room to change this country. Did you know that? It doesn't depend on a bigger crowd. It depends how big our dreams are. But I want this remnant, some of you are really being a remnant in the back row. I'd like, since we're a little smaller, I'd like to kind of get closer. If you would do me and your brothers and sisters a great favor and stand up and move down and come a little higher, come a little closer, and let's get the remnant together down here in the front. Those of you in the back, come on, don't be shy. Come on down here in the front. Lots of big spaces right here. That's it. Let's get our remnant together here. That's it. Come on down. Yeah, there are plenty of people here to change this country. I can see you all better now. I am here this year because I greatly admire CCDA. I admire those of you who are CCDA, what you do and who you are. I admire where you live. I come to you from the Sojourners community in Washington, D.C. We live 20 blocks from the White House where the children who inhabit the inner city of the last remaining superpower go to bed at night to the sound of gunfire 20 blocks away. It's a neighborhood like many of your neighborhoods, and I just thank you for living where you do and doing what you do. You know, I am uh, amazed these days at all the conversation about faith-based initiatives. Faith-based initiatives. It's, it's the rage. It's a White House office. It's a media controversy. It's um, seminars at this conference. It's the topic at Harvard. <laughs> faith-based initiatives. It's important that we understand what a faith-based initiative is. I want to suggest, though Calder Renewal supports the White House faith-based initiative, the faith-based initiative is not about White House offices. It's about the initiatives people of faith, like you, like us, take to change the conditions of life in their neighborhoods in their cities, in their nation. So let me start with a story where I learned something about a faith-based initiative. I was invited to come and speak one day at Sing Sing Prison in upstate New York. They said, come and speak to us. These are the inmates writing. Come and speak to us. I said, okay. I wrote back, when do you want me to come? They said, well, we're free most nights. <laughs> He said, we're kind of a captive audience here. <laughs> so we worked out, and I went up there, and there was this program inside the walls of Sing Sing run by the New York Theological Seminary. These are, these are prisoners who have become Christians studying to be ministers on the inside of a seminary. Only program I know of, and it's in the country of this kind. A hundred guys, way back in the bowels of the prison, 
The guards let us alone for four hours. We had an amazing evening. I'll never forget what one of those young brothers said to me that night. He said, you know, all of us here at Sing Sing, all of us are about, we're from about five neighborhoods in New York City. Just five neighborhoods in New York City. We're all from five neighborhoods. He said, it's like a train starts in my neighborhood. You get on that train when you're nine or ten years old. And the train ends up here at Sing Sing. When I get out, he said, I want to go back and stop that train. Now that's a faith-based initiative, you see. And I heard those young brothers, some younger, some older, when you're in prison, you're on the bottom of the bottom. When you can have faith to change the world from the bottom of the bottom, None of us have any excuses. Do you hear what I'm saying? A faith-based initiative. Well, two years later, I'm in New York City running a town meeting at the Marble Collegiate Church, and guess who was up on the stage, behind the platform, back home in the hood, stopping the train, but that young brother from Sing Sing. Amen? You see, that's a faith-based initiative. And that's what I want to talk about tonight. In my, uh, my wife, Joy Carol Wallace, is, a, is an Anglican uh, priest from the Church of England. She was one of the first women ordained in England about five years ago, and now she's here in the Episcopal Church. She's having a hard time, though. The Episcopal Church here is pretty... Uh, it's pretty let's say it's pretty white and suburban. <laughs> Her church was an inner city church in South London, very multiracial, multi-class, and she's struggling with her Episcopal church in this country. But when we got married, when preachers marry preachers, it's a good deal because you get a lot of new stories. <laughs> preachers always need new stories, right? Amen? Noel? Always need new material, right? Well, this is her story, true story. One of her colleagues... A young man studying to be a priest along with her. He was nervous about his first Sunday school class. Nervous about the kids, whether they'd like him or not. He was young, but he hadn't been a kid for a while, so he's nervous, and they're there waiting like you, and he's about to start. So he tries to be very kind of hip and cool and casual and leans against the pulpit. And he says, okay, kids, what's gray and furry and gathers nuts and climbs up and down trees. The kids look puzzled. The little boy raises his hand and he calls on him. And this guy, little guy, struggling with his answer, he says, I, I, know, I know the answer is supposed to be Jesus, <laughs> but it sure sounds like a squirrel to me. I love that story. Because it reminds us <laughs> that there are no easy religious answers to hard questions. And we have to be the first to say that. But yet, yet, there's this phenomenon all across the country. Faith is rising up. Faith-based organizations. Until two or three years ago, none of us knew we were FBOs. <laughs> Now we're called faith-based organizations. We were just people who were people of faith in the streets in our neighborhoods doing work that we thought God had called us to do. Now we're called FBOs. It's a new phenomenon. All over the country we're finding answers on the ground. But we have to understand what our role is, what our task is, what our calling is. And that's what I'd like to speak to you about tonight for just a few minutes. I come from Washington, a place full of politics. We've had Washington here in this conference. We've talked about the Washington Office on Faith-Based Initiatives. But in Washington, the politicians have an affliction, a disease, something that I call the wet-fingered politician syndrome. They get it by doing this all the time, licking their finger 
putting it up in the air to see which way the wind is blowing. And we, out in the country, we sometimes share in their affliction by believing that we can change a nation by replacing one wet-fingered politician with another. It doesn't happen, and we get frustrated. But you see, we should have known better. The great practitioners of the mighty social movements which have changed nations, like King and Gandhi, they understood that you don't change a nation by replacing one wet-fingered politician with another. You change a nation by changing the wind. Faith-based organizations are called to be wind changers. We are the wind changers. You change the wind, and the politicians will change very quickly. They're like, now I know some decent Christian men and women of God who are politicians, but most of them are like little pocket calculators, little weather vanes. They say which way the wind is blowing, and they move quickly. We've got to be wind changers, changing the way people think, the way they perceive fundamental questions for us, changing the context of politics is what we're called to do. Can I tell you a story, an example? I was in Sweden just a few weeks ago and was reminded that when Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. got the Nobel Peace Prize, you remember that, in 1964, he was honored with that high distinction. He came back to America and didn't even go home to Atlanta. He went to Washington, D.C. first to see the president, Lyndon Baines Johnson. He said, the great moral leader of the nation said to the great political leader, now that we have a civil rights law, this is 1964, now we need a Voting Rights Act. Johnson said, to King, I can't do that. I can't get you a Voting Rights Act. It took me all of my political chits that I cashed in with those Southern Senators to get that Civil Rights Law. I got no political capital left. It'll take me five or ten years to get a Voting Rights Act. King said, we can't wait five or ten years. Until we can vote in the South, we can't change our communities. Johnson, you know, the master of real politic, the realistic politicians, I'm sorry, I don't have the, poli it's not politically realistic. King was not one to whine, complain, or withdraw. He was one to organize, and so he did. He organized a campaign in a sleepy town in Alabama nobody had heard of called Selma. You've heard of Selma now, haven't you? In Selma, the rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, the great Jewish rabbi from the Northeast, came and marched alongside the black Baptist minister, Reverend Martin Luther King Jr., and the clergy came as they had never come before in the Civil Rights Movement. And they marched with the people of Selma across that Edmund Pettus Bridge to confront the troops of Sheriff Jim Clark. On that bridge on that Sunday, bloody Sunday they called it, a young man named John Lewis. Now Congressman John Lewis was almost beaten to death. But the nation's eyes focused on Selma the whole world was watching, and you know what? In five months, we had a Voting Rights Act. Not five years, not ten years, five months. Now, Doris Kearns Goodwin, the great presidential historian, we were on, in a conference together, and she said, and President Lyndon Johnson, in a great act of Presidential Courage went to a joint session of Congress and called for a Voting Rights Act. He said, Doris, bless his heart, but it wasn't King. It wasn't Johnson. It was King. Who changed the wind? I want to say our job is to be wind changers. I've heard the word revival over and over 
in these days and weeks. We all want to say revival. But if I read my history right, if I read my history right, revivals are measured finally by how they change a society. Revivals are not just to change inner lives as important as that is. I am an evangelical. I believe in changing individual lives. But revivals in history are when society gets changed by the transformation in individual lives, right? So that I want to say this, this evening that I am, I am an evangelical Christian. But I'm a 19th century evangelical Christian. You ever hear the name Charles Finney? An evangelist who was also an abolitionist. He linked people coming to Jesus Christ to joining the movement to overcome slavery and child labor laws and to fight for women's suffrage. He invented the altar call. Did you know that? Charles Finney invented the altar call that we know today. But do you know why he did it? Because when he was preaching so powerfully and converts came to Jesus Christ, he wanted to get their names and addresses to sign them up for the anti-slavery cause. He was an organizer. He wanted to see a movement. Now, I think that evangelicalism has lost, lost its way in, in, in the 20th century that we just came out of. I was a kid raised in an evangelical Plymouth Brethren Church. My mom and dad started the church. It was our home, our family. It was everything. But they told me, as a 14-year-old kid, they told me that Christianity has nothing to do with racism. They were good people, and they loved me, but they were wrong about the gospel. Christianity's nothing, racism is political, they told me. Christianity's personal, they said. 20th century evangelicalism lost its way. I lost my faith. I got, well, to be honest, I got kicked out of the church. <laughs> Found my home in the civil rights movement, student movements of my day, and came back to my faith, and then I discovered Finney, the 19th century evangelical. I discovered Wesley. How many of you know about William Wilberforce, the British parliamentarian, converted by John Newton, who wrote that song, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound That Saved a Wretch Like Me. Well, this guy, this brother wasn't suffering from existential angst. He really was a wretch. He was a slave trader. He came to Christ became an abolitionist, and through him, William Wilberforce became a Christian who was the parliamentarian who fought for 30 years in the British Parliament to overcome slavery, and after they won, he died three days later because his work was over. I got to visit his church, Clapham Common, Holy Trinity, and the rector took me around and proudly showed me all the paintings on the wall, the portraits of all these great, Wesleyan revivalist like Wilberforce. He was so proud. He showed me all the pictures and paraphernalia. Then he showed me a table. He said, and that's the table right there, the table. I said, the table? Yeah, the table right here. I said, what, what, what table? Well, that's the table that Wilberforce wrote, the anti-slavery legislation on that table, right there. Really, I said, yes. And every Sunday morning, it's where we celebrate the Lord's Supper. Slaves were freed, and the body and blood of Christ is celebrated on that table. That's revival that changes a nation. Now, here's the hopeful sign, my friends. I am finding a whole generation, a whole generation of young evangelical Christians, black and brown and Asian and white, who are really 19th century evangelicals. But they're entering the 21st century. They want a faith that can change the world. I think CCDA is a pioneer in that movement. 
That's what I think you're about. We're talking about changing the way we understand our faith. When I was a, a Trinity Evangelical Divinity Seminary student, by the way, I never did get that doctor thing you keep saying, doctor. I'm not, I actually didn't finish the old MDiv, you know, at Trinity, because we got in trouble with the administration at Trinity. Uh, because we did a Bible study. You want to get in trouble? Do Bible study. <laughs> we did a Bible study of every single verse in the Bible about poor people. Every single text, God's love for the poor, God being the deliverer of the oppressed, we found in the Old Testament it was the second most prominent theme. In the whole Old Testament, the first is idolatry, and they're often linked together. In the New Testament, one of every 16 verses is about the poor. In the first three Gospels, one of every 10 verses is about the poor. In the Gospel of Luke, one of every seven verses is about the poor. I named my son Luke. <laughs> and it wasn't after Luke Skywalker either. Now, one of my seminary classmates thought he'd try an experiment. He took an old Bible and a pair of scissors, and he began to cut out of the Bible every single reference to the poor. He got to Amos, let justice roll down like waters, righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. He just cut it out. Isaiah, is this not the fast that I choose to break the bond of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free? He just cut it out. The, the prophets were decimated. The Psalms destroyed. The Sermon on the Mount was gone. Jesus first Sermon at Nazareth, his Nazareth manifesto, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. Well, we had to cut that out. Dangerous text. When he was done, that old Bible was full of holes. It was falling apart in my hands. It was in shreds. The Holy Bible was a Bible full of holes. I used to take the Bible out to preach with me, and I would say, brothers and sisters, this is our American Bible. It's full of holes. From all we've taken out and paid no attention to, I want you to understand what you are doing in CCDA. You're not doing, as some would say, just social action or even economic development. You are restoring the integrity of the Word of God. in our lives, in our neighborhoods, in our communities. This is about reconnecting biblical faith with the poor whom God loves so much. We have not understood how far we have strayed. What is, a little quiz for you, what is the most famous text of all those texts in the Bible? Most famous text in America, in America about the poor. You know, no one has ever gotten that question wrong. The poor, it says, we think, you will always have with you. Mark 14, you know the story. Jesus is at Bethany. A woman wants to anoint him with oil. It's expensive. The disciples say, this is a waste of money. We could spend this on the poor. And Jesus says, now what he says in the text. What he really says in the, in the original language, what he says, you will always be with the poor. You will always be with the poor. He's saying, you're my disciples. You know what my priorities are. You know where we spend our time. You know who we spend our time with. You know who we have meals with. You know who is important to us. You will always be with the poor. So he's saying, don't get legalistic. Don't get legalistic about spending a little money on worship. My, one of my mentors is that wonderful Catholic Saint Dorothy Day who lived her life with the poor, but Dorothy loved beautiful churches. 
She loved wonderful worship. Jesus is saying, it's okay to spend a little on worship. Jesus liked, liked nice dinners as long as you had everybody there. He's saying, don't be legalistic. Don't be so politically correct, he's saying, because you know what? And he goes back to Deuteronomy in the text. You will always be with the poor. You'll always have opportunity to be with the poor. You'll always be able to do justice, to serve, to love, to care. See, when you live, Wayne, in Lawndale, you're always with the poor. It's hard to forget about the poor. You may spend a little bit on worship, but you're going to be with the poor when American Christians are no longer with the poor. They misunderstand the text. Our lack of proximity to the poor has made us misunderstand the word of God. Those people who raised me loved me, and they were loving people in so many ways. But they had lost their connection to those whom Christ calls the least of these, and they were getting the text wrong. What CCDA is doing, you are helping the church to get the text right. You're reconnecting with the Word of God and the poor, and you know what? That will make you very radical. Because if you pay attention to what the Bible says, and what you hear from those whom you're living and working with, it will make you very radical. You know, I wanted to come for a few days when you invited me here, not just for a Saturday night. So I came on Thursday, and I've been listening and talking. And you know what? I hear lots of talk about movement. <laughs> and I've heard lots of talk about all the different groups and what our roles, Kathy, you're struggling with. What are our best roles and parts and places? What do each of us do in this movement? I like the fact that you're talking about movement because we should be talking about movement. Movements are what change history. It's not just ministries. Ministries are what we do. We got Sojourner's Neighborhood Center for At-Risk Kids is a ministry. Ministries don't change history. Movements change history. Ministries can become movements, and movements change history. Now, movements don't just sort of happen all of a sudden. Do you think that Rosa Parks, in December 1955 in Montgomery, Alabama, when that day she wouldn't give up her seat on a bus, you think she was just tired? She wasn't just tired. She had been going to retreats. She had been coming to what was then CCDA conferences. She was at the Highlander Center in the hills of Tennessee. There was a whole network of African-American women in Montgomery who had been getting ready because they sensed the times were pregnant with possibilities. Things were going to change. They didn't know when. They didn't know how. Only God knows the timing of movements, but they wanted to be ready. And when she acted, they were ready, and they sprung into action the next morning. My good friend Vincent Harding, who was a lieutenant of Dr. King in those days, and my my ever-present spiritual guide and mentor, he always counsels my impatience. He says, Jim, you can't start a movement, but you can prepare for one. My friends, what we are doing is not just having workshops and talking about capacity building and funding opportunities, and here's how you can get a VISTA volunteer. I'm going to try and get one of those myself, by the way. But what we are really doing is we are getting ready for a movement. You understand what I'm saying? We are getting ready for a movement. That's what changes things. That's what always makes a difference. That's what will move things. Martin Luther King Jr. said it well about this faith-based initiative. He said, the church must be reminded that it is not the master or the servant of the state, but rather the conscience of the state. Hear him well. Neither master nor servant, but conscience. We as faith-based organizations 
are not. We must not just be another agency through which funds can flow. We must not, we must not be another service provider only. We must be the prophetic interrogators of a system. We must ask the question, why? Why are people eating at food banks and soup lines and living in shelters? We must have that voice to be a conscience of the state. And as your theme says, it is time to come together. In Kansas City, Missouri, in 1954, we had a remarkable, remarkable event. It was a gang peace summit. That's right, 126 young gang members from 25 cities. We had Crips and Bloods and Vice Lords and gangster disciples from Chicago, GDs. How many? 50,000 GDs. Now they call themselves the Growth and Development Group, GD. <laughs> we had Cobras, Latin Kings from 25 cities to try to make a peace. Young people had buried too many of their friends. They'd gone to too many funerals. They came together, and the only people they invited to be with them were a handful of us religious leaders. Because they said to do this, to end the madness, we need spiritual power. Spiritual power. These aren't the youth choir. These are the gangsters. We need spiritual power. On that last morning in St. Stephen's Baptist Church, Mac Charles Jones, about 350 pounds of Baptist minister, preached the prodigal son. You know the story. The young man, young Jewish man, is in the hog pen. That's the bottom if you're a young Jewish man. In the hog pen. In the hog pen, it says he came to himself. He didn't hear an hear a, a evangelistic radio program. He didn't get a track. He was in the hog pen, and he came to himself. And he knew he had a home. And he got himself up, and he walked home, and his daddy was waiting. And in the story, as you know, all you theologians, the daddy is the God figure, waiting for his children to come home. And, and he sees his daddy, and he says, oh, he starts, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I screwed up, I screwed up. I'll never. His daddy didn't want him to apologize. He said, I've been waiting, and I've been waiting. You know he wasn't just waiting that day. He must have been waiting every day for his son to come home, weeping, crying, I want my son to come home. And when he came home, he wouldn't even let his son apologize. He just said, my son has come home. We're going to have a party. A party! So Mac Jones, Baptist minister, said, okay, brothers and sisters, get up from the hog pen. Come down the aisle. The church is waiting, and he looked like God standing there. And when you come home, we're going to have a party. Now, to give an altar call is always a scary thing. How many verses of Just As I Am can you sing? We sang four or five, waiting. Now, this is Max congregation, and then 125 gangsters. Two young men come down the aisle. They get into the pulpit. One is a crypt. And one is the blood. They've been trying to kill each other for a year in a drug war in Kansas City. And they dropped their gang colors. That blue kerchief, that red kerchief, they dropped their gang colors in the pulpit. And they embraced. And with tears in their eyes, they said, from now on, we walk the same road together from now on. Crip in the blood, not a dry eye in the congregation. But my tears came when I asked myself, if the Crips and Bloods can drop their colors, how come the churches can't? Oh, no, we're, we're evangelical. We're evangelical. No, we're, we're mainline. No, we're Catholic. No, we're black church. We're historic black church. No, we're parachurch. We're, we are like gangs. Our grievances, our grudges, our paraphernalia, our turf, our territory, our righteousness. We know why they're wrong. We won't work with them. We're like gangs. 
and our kids are falling between the cracks of our gang warfare. The call to renewal was inspired by a crip and a blood dropping their colors in the pulpit. And I came home and said, we got to get our, our own truce. Our church gang warfare has to stop. So we had a table. Some of you were there. And we had the Catholic bishops. They're a really big gang. <laughs> They got chapters all over the country, you know. We, we had World Vision there. They're another big one, you know. CCDA was there in the house. Leadership foundations were there. We had the National Association of Evangelicals, 23 million of them. And we had next door in this next chair was the National Council of Churches. Uh-oh. They're like the Cribs and Bloods. There they were at the same table. And for nine hours, we almost had to lock the door. Nine hours, we're going to pray and struggle and do our Bible study until we can make a gang truce. And I knew it was God's work when they didn't leave. And they stayed, and that began this call to renewal. And then we had, like, you know, we had Noel. Noel wanted to get arrested really bad. So... They had this bill in the Congress, this welfare reform bill. I'm for welfare reform. I live in a neighborhood where welfare isn't working. But this was a bad bill. It didn't give those single moms the help and support they needed to get from welfare to work. It just kicked them off the welfare rolls. The idea is not just reduce your welfare rolls. The idea is to reduce poverty. Am I right? But we didn't give them the help they needed. Child care, transportation, housing help, a little bit of help goes a long way, as you all know. It wasn't in the bill, and so a bunch of radical remnants, Mary Nelson, I don't think Kathy was there. Next time, Kathy, we're going to get you in the room. Eugene River is always ready for some trouble. And Noel, Tony Campola, Ron Sider, there we were, 55 inner city pastors and priests, in the rotunda of the U.S. Capitol, we read from Isaiah, Woe to you legislators who pass infamous laws, who deny the poor among my people of their rights, <laughs> who crush widows and orphans, meaning single moms and their kids. In the rotunda, there was an eighth grade Catholic high school class from the suburbs. They were in to get a, they were there, a civics lesson that day. I'll tell you, it's a tough thing to, to make eighth graders speechless. It's a hard job. But they just stopped talking. Their eyes got as big as saucers, and they saw all these clergy with all our uniforms on, our costumes on, our paraphernalia, our collars, and we were singing and praying. Singing and praying is a wonderful thing, and reading the Bible. But, you know, it depends where you do it. <laughs> If you do it there, you'll have the sergeant at arms come and say with a bullhorn, it is illegal to pray in the rotunda of the U.S. Capitol. And we kept praying. Rivers, that's all Rivers needed. Pray me some more, he said. Pray me some more. They handcuffed every one of us and took us away, and the kids were utterly silent. They watched and they watched, and when the last pastor was led away, the young people clapped their hands. And the New York Times was there. And the reporter went and he asked this young woman, eighth grade young woman, what did you learn today about democracy? She said, I learned that sometimes you got to stand up for what you believe. But when you do, it's good to have some people with you. <laughs> And that's what called renewal is, standing up for those that God calls special poor. And, you know, it's good to have each other with us. So a lot of you don't even know that when this big tax cut came down this spring, there was nothing in it for working families who don't make enough to pay income tax. You know, remember that? There was a child tax credit 
It was increased, but only for middle-class families. I was for that. I'm a family-friendly guy. But what about those working families that don't make enough to even get it until we call together a SWAT team? CCDA, World Vision, the Catholic bishops, and the Evangelicals for Social Action called Renewal, called them together. We went and saw Senator Santorum, Congressman Watts, White House, and we said, you want our support for this faith-based initiative, and we want to support you, but we really care about a child tax credit for poor working families, too. Can't we include them as well? All behind the scenes, but the White House and the Congress turned around on that question, and 10 million poor children are going to get a tax credit, and CCDA was a part of why it happened. <laughs> but now we have some challenges ahead. Will poor children be the next victims of September 11th. I've been traveling the country, and you know, you know, faith-based organizations, social service providers are getting fewer donations than before across the country. And the need is rising. Since September 11th, 714,000 people have lost their jobs. Many of them are at the lower end of the employment ladder anyway, and many in Americans are one paycheck away from poverty. Here's what I think we got to say to our nation. When those twin towers fell, America suffered together. There was a profound equality in our suffering. CEOs and janitors, law partners and data process workers all died together, and their families cried together. I was on the pile one week ago in New York City. The clergy in Red Cross took me and I stood and prayed on that pile. I met six groups of firefighters, Orange County, Canada, all over the country. They weren't there to volunteer. They were there to go to the memorial services. And they said, just to be here. I've been to holy sites around the world and seen pilgrims come that's what they were. Pilgrims coming to a holy site. These events could change us or they could set us back for a long time. My favorite theologian in this crisis has been Julia Roberts. <laughs> How many of you know Julia Roberts? America's sweetheart. On that big telethon they had, did you see that? I wasn't expecting much wisdom from dear sister Julia Roberts. But you know what she said? She said, Tearfully, we learned in this crisis that you don't just save yourself, you save each other. America suffered together. America must now heal together. My friends, no bailouts for airliners unless the 140,000 airline workers get taken care of, too. No economic stimulus packages that are mostly tax cuts for the wealthiest and nothing for those who are left unemployed. We have to speak the truth here. This war is costing us now $1 billion a month in Afghanistan. We've got to say, we've got to say that while we must, I, I live on a target. I'm 20 blocks from the White House. My son, Luke lives on a target for terrorists. I want to stop and prevent the terrorists from doing this again. But I don't want to keep bombing the children of the Arab world in our desire to get the terrorists. How do we keep this from becoming a wider war? How do we remember that our job is to protect the innocents, the children in our neighborhoods and the children in Arab neighborhoods? This has got to be our job. It's hard. It's hard. It's going to be controversial. It's going to be difficult. Who's going to raise the hard questions? We must say, 
However, in this crisis, the American flag must not become a blindfold. Stay with the kids. My advice is stay talking about the kids. That's what you do best. Keep doing it, but don't ignore the kids over there, too. The kids, that's it. That's the whole, I was coming to do a retreat for the mayor of Seattle one night, and I went out to my truck the night before to get a few things, and I made a mistake. I know better, but I wasn't, as we say in my neighborhood, watching my back. <laughs> and by the time I heard the running feet behind me, it was too late. They were on me, and I had a big, somebody hit me with something really sharp. And I felt this cut open up in my left side of my face, and the blood comes pouring down, and hands pushing me to the ground, saying, keep him down, get his money, take his wallet. And I'm laying there on the ground. It was cold, winter, winter night, 5 o'clock. It was not late, but it was very dark. And I'm laying there in the whole car, cold pavement, and I'm saying to myself, I'm getting mugged. The first time. This is after all these years living in the mean streets. This is official. I'm getting mugged. This is what it feels like. I, I was kind of, it was kind of a funny thing. I'm laying there saying, this is it, man. This is a, and I jumped up to face my assailants. And they're all kids. Four young men, 14, 15. One of them was about 13 because I get up fast. They, they get surprised. They square. They square, you know. And they, and they circle, you know. They always find the leader, make the eye contact, and he's squaring. And the 13-year-old, he's cool. He's been doing lots of TV because he's, he's kicking. He's karate kicking. You know, he's, he's flailing away, you know. He's, he's very earnest but very ineffectual, like a little mosquito buzzing around, you know. So there they are. They're ready to rock and roll. So I just scold them. <laughs> I just said, just stop it, you guys. Stop it. Stop terrorizing people. Stop this crap. And they drop their arms, not used to being scolded. <laughs> then I said, I'm a pastor. You want to take a pastor's money and beat him up? You, is that how you want to spend your evening, guys? They turned and they fled. <laughs> Clergy in the street are scary. But as they ran away, my little karate kicker looks back at me, little guy, with a sad voice and a sad face. He says, Pastor, Pastor, would you ask God for a blessing for me? The social service systems want to give up on a whole generation of our kids. They're dangerous. They're scary. I mean, I'm not underestimating, and I had now stitches above my eye to prove the point. But it's not an option for us. <laughs> if children made in the image of God have gotten lost somehow, it says as much about us as it does about them. So who will take the time? Who will take the time to put the opportunity and the love, and yes, the discipline in the lives of those kids. If we do that, here's the good news. We all get the blessing. <laughs> we all get it. Isaiah 58 is my text. It says, if you share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless into your house, then will your light rise like the dawn, your healing come quickly. Oh, no, no, you must mean, sorry, you must mean the, uh, their healing, right? No, it doesn't say their healing. Your healing. Oh, you, it's just the poor that are getting fixed here and healed and taken. No, no, Isaiah says, no, it's your healing that's at stake here. My Harvard students volunteer in record numbers beyond what is necessary for a balanced resume. <laughs> I say, why are you doing all this stuff? And they say, they're looking for meaning. They're looking for connection looking for healing. Here's a newsflash. Shopping doesn't satisfy the deepest longings of the human heart. A whole generation of people are looking for healing. Are we going to offer that or not? Tonight, you probably didn't hear before I came, an hour ago was the worst 
terrorist attack in Jerusalem in many years. 150 people are now on their way to the hospital. Who will break the cycle of violence? Who will offer another way? Martin said, eye for an eye. You keep going for long enough with that and the whole world is blind. We have got to step in for the sake of the kids and we've got to provide, and this is my last story, we've got to provide the thing that CCDA does best. Faith-based organizations do one thing better than anybody else. We can fundraise, we can organize, we can mobilize, but there is one thing that is crucial for social change to happen, for spiritual transformation to occur. One thing you can't do without, and that is the simple dynamic of hope. Hope! Hebrew says now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Or my paraphrase of that is this, hope is believing in spite of the evidence and then watching the evidence change. That's our job. That's what we do. We may do other things well, but we got to do that best of all. we got to provide the hope that makes change possible. I've learned a lot about hope from people like you all over the world. And I'll close with my favorite story about hope from South Africa, where... <laughs> where several years ago, Nelson Mandela is still in jail. All the political leaders have been exiled, banned, tortured, killed. The only ones left standing are some church leaders. Ever heard of Archbishop Desmond Tutu? It was in his cathedral. I got snuck into the country by World Vision. World Vision risked their status with the government by sneaking me into the country to be with our friends in distress, persecution, for six weeks. And my first morning, I was in Bishop Tutu's cathedral in Cape Town, and I'll never forget what he taught me that day about hope. Because they canceled the political rally the government had, and he said, okay, we're going to have church. Try and cancel that. They wouldn't cancel that, so he went ahead, and he had church, and he was preaching, and we're all huddled there in the church. And outside, there were three times as many police and military troops as there were worshipers on the inside. They were there to intimidate, to threaten, to make us afraid. And with me, at least, it was working. <laughs> you could feel the tension, the threat of violence in the air, and there... In those doors, in comes the security police, the South African security police. They interrupted his sermon. Desmond Tutu was preaching, and they had the arrogance and the rudeness to come in and stand there along the walls of his church and with their tape recorders, tape record everything he was saying and write down what he was saying to intimidate him and threaten him and say, okay, you be bold, you be strong, you be prophetic, and we'll put you in jail again. They were being so blasphemous, I thought. What would he say? What would he do? We all watched him. He stopped preaching. Is that on? He looked at them. He pointed his finger at the police. And he said, you are powerful. You are very powerful. But you are not gods. And I serve a God who cannot be mocked. Then he smiled that big Desmond Tutu smile. You've seen it. He smiled that smile, and he says, you, you have already lost. <laughs> You've already lost. So, then he began to bounce like a good Baptist preacher. He got there on the, he says, so, since you've already lost, we invite you today to come and join the winning side. Come and join the winning side, he said. And the young people began to stand up and dance 
and we just got caught up and danced out with them. They danced into the street, and the police were there, and the police moved back because the police didn't expect dancing worshipers. And we danced in the streets of South Africa. And 10 years later, I was at the inauguration of Nelson Mandela, and I said to Bishop Tutu, Bishop, do you remember that day in St. George's? Do you remember what you said? And he smiled. I said, Bishop, today, They've all joined the winning side. They've all joined. The world joined the winning side. Hope is believing in spite of the evidence and watching the evidence change. That's what CCDA's job is. So that one day, when this movement that God knows the timing of, I don't, God's going to break this movement open. You've been laying the foundations. God's going to do it. And one day, we can look into the face of the injustice and the greed and the drugs and the guns and kids that their education is determined by their, their zip code. We look at all that and we smile like Desmond Tutu smiled. And we say, you have already lost. So we invite you today to come and join the winning side. Hope is believing in spite of the evidence and then watching the evidence change. CCDA, God bless you and I love you.